I'm really thrilled to have Mike Williams here, who uh, had, comes to us from Baltimore. Uh, Mike did his undergraduate uh, at Valparaiso, went on to IU, probably one of the largest services in the country, neuroscience services. When I, uh, when I look at their neurosurgical department, which is pr the largest in the country, it's a pretty impressive uh, department of private practitioners and academic people. Uh, and then he went off to do critical care at Hopkins. I, I forgot that he did critical care at Johns Hopkins for about a decade or so. Uh, and then he saw the light, uh, and he used his uh, expertise to develop uh, both a transitional and adult hydrocephalus program. And as you know, in this department, because we're the only um, really the only resource for five states, we do an enormous amount of, um, of congenital work. Whether you refer to that, the Shantology, probably uh, over 200 at Harborview, uh, over probably 150 at the university, and certainly uh, close to 200 at Children's. And there really isn't, you know, uh, Jeff Ogeman says, we practice the art of abandonment. As soon as they turn 21, we throw them into the community. And only John Lozier for years was being the, um, um, it was being the pediatrician, adult internist, and neurosurgeon. And we can't afford to do that any longer, either in this community, anywhere in the country, because the patients really have had it. And so uh, I went out and we looked uh, for the best person in the country, and that happens to be Mike. Mike's one of a kind, really, uh, of an adult neurologist uh, um, that um, has expertise across a lot of strata of expertise. So uh, in, uh, uh, dementia, um, acute care, such as uh, neuro ICU, and then congenital problems. And he also, uh, besides uh, uh, being uh, doing a great job in writing up his thoughts and publishing over 75 papers. He also has grants, and he has a fascinating NASA grant from NASA to, to study. Uh, uh, well, he'll tell you what it's about. And he's going to talk about both his NASA research on hydrocephalus in space and then also his adult congenital program. And I'm hoping, you know, Bruce Ransom and I, as directors of the neuroscience program, are hoping to get him here. But of course, Hopkins wants him, Methodist wants him, and so on and so forth. Lesser institutions, certainly, but uh, certainly uh, great places. Uh, so uh, please welcome Mike Williams and I interact with him freely after that. He's going to be here for a couple of days. So Mike, thank you. Very thank you very much. much. Well, good morning. If I walk and talk, are you going to be able to hear me? So, um, um, I am, as, as Rich said, a bit of a, an unusual neurologist in that I know quite a bit about hydrocephalus. It's been my field of, of expertise for more than 25 years. And I realize it's probably heresy to say it in this audience, but I know more about hydrocephalus than most neurosurgeons do. <laughs> Uh, and I know more about shunts and how they work than, than most neurosurgeons do. And I, I say that in part because I receive patients who have had ongoing care at centers out where they don't have expertise in hydrocephalus. So uh, because I've been in this field for 25 years, I want to tell you how I developed this lifetime perspective on hydrocephalus. Uh, and then in the second half of the talk, I'm going to which is titled Zero G and ICP, I want to tell you about my experience working with NASA for the last five years. So here are my disclosures for you. Uh, NeuroDX uh, development, some of you may know that, they have a non-invasive method for detecting uh, shunt obstruction in, in uh, children, and we're working on them for <laughs> adults. And uh, some of you may know this group, Aqueduct Critical Care. I'm on the board of directors for SAM. So I started. Uh, uh, my career, as I said, 25 years ago, and it started with NPH, and it sort of progressed to younger and younger populations. I want to tell you about that, uh, to tell you how I got to this lifetime perspective, and I, I think I want to show you why there is such a, a need, why we have to think about patients from birth to death, to, to senescence, uh, because if, if we don't do that, many of them are left in the lurch. And so, normal pressure hydrocephalus, 
was first described actually 51 years ago by Solomon Hakim. Uh, and um, don't trust the New England Journal of I'm Medicine. Uh, it was not Adams. Hmm? It was described in 1955 here by Art Ward and Elton Fultz in a paper that has been ignored for a long time. I'll, I'll, I'll take that as, as a correction. <laughs> Sorry. So, but I, unfortunately, I, I don't have a picture George of myself with, uh, with Elton Fultz. Well, it's okay. If you get the camera. Oh, so I know, I understand. The last picture. Holy mackerel. It's not on midline, then it doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's right. It's okay, but. <laughs> <laughs> it is true that he described it in 1964. That's correct. The slide is correct. This, this is his slide thesis. Is correct. He did describe it, but it wasn't the first description. <laughs> okay. it, it's attributed to Solomon, we'll put it that way. <laughs> Uh, and uh, you can see uh, that's an old picture of, of me. Solomon passed away a, a couple of years ago. And if any of you have ever wondered where did the, the name normal pressure hydrocephalus came from, it's from the, the translation of the, the title of his thesis uh, in, in Spanish, the syndrome of hydrocephalus with normal KSF pressure. Um, so back in the, the mid-1960s, everybody went gaga over this. They saw this as, as a treatable dementia. There was a lot of excitement <coughs> for it. Uh, here actually is some video of one of Solomon's original patients. He had video, uh, actually Super 8, I think. So this is the patient before shunt surgery. And look at that gait. And here's the same patient two weeks after surgery. So this is pretty dramatic. And this is one of the, the biologically interesting things about hydrocephalus. If you ask yourself, how can you have symptoms like that for so long that reverse so quickly? There's not a lot of mechanisms that, that do that. So after the publication of this in this, the 60s, we went through the next 25 years through a period of exuberance. Everybody was getting shunted. It was touted as a treatable dementia. Now, for the residents and students, the only way that we could diagnose hydrocephalus back then was with a procedure called pneumoencephalography. <laughs> you remember that? Yeah. Pneumoencephalography. Now you guys are quiet. I mean, you're stuck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, now, now you don't want to admit that. <laughs> so pneumoencephalography is where you do a lumbar puncture, remove most of the CSF, and take a 50cc syringe and inject air in it. And it outlines the ventricles. It's air contrast. Uh, so there were lots of people who had big ventricles, and they were getting shunts. And then in the early 1970s, there was report after report after report of subdurals, patients who were not getting better, infections, and, and so forth. So there were a lot of catastrophes, and that turned into skepticism and nihilism in, in the field. And this paper was published in uh, 1992 uh, from uh, the Netherlands, and they clearly came down against normal pressure hydrocephalus. They said it's very rare and the risks are too great for shunting these patients. And this is right about the time that I started at Hopkins as a neuro ICU fellow, which was in 1989. Those of you who know Kira Becker, I was junior faculty when Kira was a fellow at Hopkins. And uh, my mentor there, Dan Hanley, said, well, Mike, why don't you see what you can do with this? And this is the first description of using external lumbar drainage to diagnose hydrocephalus, so by Hahn and Tomer. Uh, and so that's how, essentially how I fell into hydrocephalus. So I was working in the neurocritical care unit, and then I had a side practice, so to speak, of these patients with hydrocephalus. And if you're the person at an academic medical center who's interested in something that's very uncommon and that most other people don't take care of, you know what happens all of those patients start coming to you. So my practice started growing and growing and growing, uh, and so the research opportunities came out. And what I learned in that period of time is that neurosurgeons, at least at Hopkins 25 years ago, were not interested in the longitudinal care of these patients. So I would send them to a neurosurgeon, they'd get a shunt, the surgeon would say good luck with that, and nobody was following them up. So I started a clinic where I would follow them up. And then uh, there were some other lessons that I learned in how to take care of them. They really need an interdisciplinary model of care. And, I, and I'm a big proponent of the role of neurologists in the care of these patients because 
we're trained for longitudinal care. That's what we do for a living. That's what we like to do for a living. So the nihilism was still out there. And my, my very first abstract was in 1993 at the ANA. That's the Academic Neurology Society. It was a poster. Uh, and this kind of pompous neurology chair comes up to me and says, no such thing because he had never, ever seen it. And I said, well, here's 25 cases right here on the poster, and he was not impressed. So let me show you what we've been able to demonstrate just by asking some simple questions. So this is the spinal catheter protocol. This is the ELD. It's a big needle. Neurology residents usually get pupillary dilation when I put that needle into their hand. It's a 16-gauge catheter. This is the old setup. We do monitor CSF pressure if necessary. And I do my uh, spinal catheters with the patient seated. It's better for them. I'm not interested in opening pressure. It doesn't tell you anything. And taking a lesson from surgeons, I actually mark the iliac crests and the spinous processes so I know where I'm going when I'm, when I'm doing the lumbar puncture on the patients. And so you can uh, monitor pressure for a couple days if you need to. Most patients just need controlled CSF drainage because their gait is so impaired. And so our first paper we showed uh, which was published about a decade ago, that you can predict the outcome of hydrocephalus with this Tony Marmoreau's paper, which is the other large series, came out about the, the same time. Gait is the most likely to occur, uh, to improve, and the most rapid to improve, and then cognition and urinary symptoms after that. And I think a lot of this speaks to the comorbidities that contribute to the urinary, urinary symptoms and to uh, the gait. So this is pretty well accepted around the world that uh, ELD is a good way to diagnose hydrocephalus. We also showed that you can take care of high-risk populations. I came out of critical care. There's not a lot that scares me because I've taken care of some of the biggest hairiest cases the nurse surgeons have brought into us, you know, <coughs> bilateral cranies, degloving of the face, traumatic brain injuries. And so a patient coming in already on Coumadin, well, that's not a big deal. You just have to know how to handle their anticoagulation. But the fear that most people have is if I put a shunt into somebody who's on Coumadin, I'm going to cause a huge complication for that patient. Later on, they're going to get a subdural, and they're going to bleed into it, and you can't control it. So we took the very simple approach of saying if you put in a spinal catheter, of course, you've got the patient off of the anticoagulation for this, monitor their ICP, drain their CSF, demonstrate whether they should have a shunt or not, then you're properly selecting the patients and the risk of a subdural should be smaller. So here are the, the outcomes. And again, this is a retrospective series of the 25 patients that we found, which is about 5% of our population. And that is, in fact, representative of the epidemiology of anticoagulation in the elderly. It's about 5% of them. Uh, 16 improved with ELD. One of them refused surgery, and 13 out of the 15 who got a shunt, in fact, improved. And we followed them. We used, this was the er early when adjustable shunts were around. We tend to start at a high setting and work our way down with that population, follow them with CT scans. We had shunt revisions for the usual reasons, distal obstruction in adults, proximal obstruction in children. One subdural, so let me tell you about that one subdural. There's always a learning curve. This is one of our very first patients. He was a VIP from somewhere across the ocean, and he had ascites, and his liver wasn't working very well, which means his coags weren't working very well. And he was also on heparin in transition. Uh, and he, he got a subdural, and we took the shunt out and didn't put it back in. And Dan Rigamonti and I both have said we would never, ever do him again or anybody like that again. So you, you do have a learning curve as, as you go through this. So now next we started to look at the neurological <coughs> outcomes. MPH had originally been described as a treatable dementia, and then there were all these catastrophes, and nobody believed it existed. So we started to, to ask, well, what's actually happening? What is the nature of their dementia, and how much better is it getting? Uh, and we used a fairly high threshold in the field of, of dementia for improvement which is that you know, four-point mini is not so big, but improvement by one standard deviation in 50% of the neurocognitive subtests, that's a high bar. That's a very high bar. And we found that about half of those patients were showing overall neurocognitive improvement. And more importantly, it's not just a minuscule increase in a score, it's functional improvement. Patients who are unable to manage their lives, who now can do their banking and return to driving, 
Sometimes caregiver roles would switch. The patient with hydrocephalus was now well enough to take care of the spouse who used to take care of the patient with hydrocephalus. Well, that, that's a, and that's a, a big issue in, in the field. And then uh, other groups have shown the same thing. A couple papers from Barcelona, from, from Cornell, and the European <coughs> trial. And this improvement, because we test them again and again, is not from a practice effect. There's been some interesting work out of Barcelona to show that there isn't a practice effect in the NPH patients. And if you had an Alzheimer's drug that caused this much improvement in cognition, it would be a multi-billion dollar drug. And we're getting amazing improvements in cognition, and most neurologists don't recognize this. They, they think there's just, it's just not there, but it is. So the next, and this is one of my lessons from taking care of patients when there was no longitudinal follow-up from the neurosurgeons, every once in a while they'd come back and they were getting worse. Or maybe they never got better in the first place. And the prevailing attitude 25 years ago was, well, at least we tried and it didn't work. And I said, well, how do you know that the patient even had a chance to get better? If they got better and they got worse, we need to figure out, is the shunt functioning or not? Or if they never got better, was the shunt obstructed early on? So we investigate, investigated that question and found that if you look at the group of patients who had so far had only one shunt revision, found the obstruction, fixed it, three quarters of them would get better for six to 12 months. So finding and fixing shunt obstruction is part of the longitudinal care of these patients. Now the, the more revisions they have, the less likely they are to uh, improve, but you have to be actively involved. If you had a patient with a DBS who was suddenly getting worse, you wouldn't say, oh well, that was nice while it lasted. You'd investigate the, the battery and, and the, the stimulator and so forth to find out what was happening with it. And so we need to apply that same principle to hydrocephalus. The next is that we showed shunting the elderly reduces health care expenditures. So I, I have permission to tell this. This is one of our patients. She was very grateful. Her friend, Phoebe Sharkey, had expertise using the Medicare database <coughs> to analyze uh, economics. And they came to us and they said, can we help you do some research on hydrocephalus? And we said, sure. And so we spent a lot of time trying to figure out the questions we wanted to ask. And a 5% Medicare sample, I love this N, 1,238,895. Anybody of you had an N like that in one of your studies? So the index year was 1999. We did this work, uh, the research itself, about 2005. And they had to have both Part A and Part B. And we used a conservative definition for the diagnosis of hydrocephalus. Now, the, the risk of research like this is you only get the diagnoses that are put on the bills by the hospital or by the, the physician. So it's not perfect, but it gives you some indication of what's happening out there. So we found 1,441 patients <laughs> who had that diagnosis. That's a prevalence in the elderly of 0.12%. <laughs> Only 25% of patients who had the diagnosis of hydrocephalus got a shunt. Three quarters did not. So that's the first question to ask. Why is that happening? Why are we listing this diagnosis, yet three out of four times we're not treating that diagnosis? We also happen to find some health care disparities in this. Patients who were older were less likely to re receive a shunt. Age over 85, only 20% is likely to get a shunt if they had the diagnosis. And African Americans were only 50% as likely to get a shunt if they carried the diagnosis of hydrocephalus. And the, the, Data can't tell us why. They only tell us that this was, was happening. So how much does it save? <coughs> Over five years, $25,000. So let me put that in perspective. That's $5,000 a year at a time when average Medicare expenditures per patient were $8,000 a year. So that's a huge chunk of change. That's a big amount. And if you then factor in the complications, because the complications were there, but they actually weren't statistically significant. But we said, well, let's factor this in anyway. We saved $157 million by treating those patients with hydrocephalus. So it, it raises the question, what would happen? How much would we save if we treated more of the patients with hydrocephalus? So here's the, the summary of, of some of what we've done in, in the field, which is that you can diagnose normal pressure hydrocephalus based on CSF drainage. Shunting patients has good outcomes. 
you can treat high-risk patients if you're careful, if you know what you're doing, you monitor them, start to use programmable shunts. There's tremendous improvement in cognition. If you look for shunt obstruction and treat it, you're going to get three-quarters of your patients better again, and treating hydrocephalus in the elderly reduces healthcare expenditures. So, so that's my, my NPH story for you. So this work is not just our work. There are all the other major centers in, around the world have really developed in the last 25 years. In, in Sweden, there's Gothenburg and, and Umia, uh, many centers in, in Japan, Barcelona, Germany, Cambridge. More and more centers are emerging uh, in, in Asia. And all of them are showing <coughs> that we can diagnose NPH reliably, the treatment is safe, the complications are few, and their symptoms can improve, and the only limitation is their comorbidity. So if they have a bad hip and NPH, their gait isn't going to get perfect, but it's going to get better. The Japanese are very, very interested in this disorder because the elderly population is much larger in Japan as a proportion of, of the population, and they're thinking very much about the health care expenditures that are associated with them. So there's international guidelines, and then the, the Japanese actually have their own set of guidelines for the diagnosis and treatment of high MPH has been revised uh, once. And here are some of the, the papers that are, are showing this. Here's a paper on comorbidities, uh, the guidelines, the international guidelines, the Japanese guidelines. This is the first uh, NIH workshop uh, paper. Uh, we had that workshop 10 years ago in 2005. Uh, Sam Browd's about to publish the the paper for the third workshop that, that was here in uh, Seattle in 2012. Now, any single center <laughs> gets a lot of patients, relatively speaking, but our ends are still pretty small. And uh, about uh, one of the outcomes of the NIH workshop many years ago was the creation of the Pediatric Hydrocephalus Clinical Research Network, which John Kessel heads out of the University of, of Utah. Uh, and starting about Two and a half or three years ago, Mark Hamilton from the University of Calgary and I started talking about the creation of an adult network, and I've, I've worked with Mark, and, and my center is one of the founding centers for the AHCRN. We've just gotten started this year with our, our registry and so forth, but we're now pooling the data from at least six different centers so that we can begin to understand the, what's really happening in the field of adult hydrocephalus. And we have specifically said anybody over the age of 18 is included in this network. And if you're really interested in hydrocephalus, the uh, International Societies meeting is in Banff in September. Uh, and uh, if for nothing else than Banff in the fall, there's a good reason to go to it. But if you're interested in hydrocephalus, the best experts in the world will be there. This is the meeting to go to every year. So now, if you read the neurology literature, the neurologists keep saying this is a rare disorder. There was a, a paper from the Mayo Clinic that was published about three years ago that said this is a rare disorder. I think, quite honestly, I don't think it's a very good paper, but it's from the Mayo Clinic and it got published, and so everybody <coughs> believes it. But out of Western Sweden, Gothenburg, this is Carson Wickelso's work, they used the international guidelines definition of prevalence for probable NPH, and they said it's 0.2% of persons aged 70 to 79 and 5.9% of those over the age of 80. Well, if you apply that to the United States Census, that's about 700,000 persons who have probable NPH. So, do you treat brain tumors here? Yeah. Do you have an MS center here? Yeah. Do you have a myasthenia center here? So how do you think that number compares to the national data for those disorders? We can just do the, the price is right, high, low game if you like. How many, how do you think it is compared to, to brain tumor? Is this higher or lower than the number of people with brain tumors in the U.S.? 700,000 is considerably higher. Any neurologists want to comment on MS? Well, MS is high here. The prevalence is much higher in Seattle. Right, right. So let me show you. And remember, these are not my numbers. These are numbers from the websites for these societies that have a vested interest in showing what their, their prevalence is. So I, I point this out as a way of, of saying, especially in the field of, of neurology, we've got as many patients who may have NPH around the United States as may have MS, if not more. 
and how many academic medical centers have neurologists who are actively involved in the care of patients with hydrocephalus? So the numbers are, are quite large. These are patients who deserve to be investigated. So let's think about the population impact of that. Uh, John Ney was here in the Department of Neurology. He's done a lot of uh, database work, and he and I did a, a little work together two years ago and found out that first shunt operations, separate from revisions, there were about 5,000 per year in the United States. So it would only take 140 years to shunt everybody who has or potentially has hydrocephalus right now if we stay at that rate. But we would save, again, using the data that we came up with, probably $17 billion if we did that. So there, there is, again, a huge impact. So what's happening to the elderly population? This is a population pyramid. All of us older folks are up here. This is age 70, 74 and older up there. This is the group, group that's at greatest risk for hydrocephalus. Watch what happens over the next 30 years. Look at the numbers here. It's getting larger and larger and larger. The sheer number of patients who are going to be at risk for NPH is getting larger over the next 30 years. So now, let me tell you a little bit about the next younger population that I started to take care of, uh, which we call Shyman. That's the syndrome of hydrocephalus in young and middle-aged adults. And I started to see them in the mid to late 1990s. They were trickling in, and I wasn't really thinking about them as a separate group until Emily Fudge, who was the, the founder of the Hydrocephalus Association, said, hey, Mike, can you talk about your experience with these patients? And this was the 2000 meeting that Hal Rieke hosted in, in Phoenix. And so I started to look into it and realized that we had a story to tell. And John Cowan, his first author on this paper, he helped us to put it together, describing this syndrome. And it's, we define this as patients between the ages of 18 and 55. And they were coming in with relatively subtle symptoms. They had some cognitive complaints, but they weren't demented. Many of them were working. They were a little clumsy. They were maladroit, kind of like me. I was a kid always out in right field in Little League. Um, they had urinary complaints. They had to go to the bathroom a lot. They were rarely incontinent. And they had chronic headaches. More than half of these patients had chronic headaches. And a lot of them had been to doctors. They had scans, and they were told, well, you know, go get a sports car. It's a midlife crisis, or it's called psychiatric problems. So here are people with real problems, and they're being dismissed. And it's kind of like subtle NPH with a headache, that same symptom domains. But 84% of those who were working had impaired job performance. So this is the difference between the NPH population and this population. If you treat this population, their job is at risk because they're having cognitive impairment from their untreated hydrocephalus. So this is important. And we, their symptoms were so mild that you couldn't assess response to gait, for example, as a way of knowing whether you should shunt them or not. There was a ceiling effect with that. So we said, well, why don't we look at the hydrodynamics of it? We monitored the intracranial pressure. These are B waves, same kind of thing you'd see if you did continuous monitoring in the, the neurocritical care unit. In fact, you, you can put hydrocephalus tracings right next to traumatic brain injury tracings, and you can't tell them apart. It's the same type of, of B waves. And we diagnosed them, and they were incredibly grateful that we said, yes, you have something that is real. You have something that is treatable. So this is one of my very first patients. Nice guy. I still see him. I think he's 55 at this point. He was a music teacher. He could not follow a score, multiple lines of, of music, and he had to run out to the bathroom after ev every class. And you look at that and you say, eh, maybe not so bad, but this is what he looked like after he got shunted. So look at the re-expansion of the brain. Look at the corpus callosum here and here. It's thin here. It's re-expanded here. This is not slit ventricle. This is actually normal ventricular size for an adult. Uh, so about half of the patients had complete improvement in their symptoms. About a third had partial improvement. Now, usually it was headaches that did not get better. But the causes are important. About 40% of them were what we call idiopathic hydrocephalus. We looked for risk factors. We couldn't find them. 41% had risk factors, acquired hydrocephalus, meningitis, TBI, tumor. One out of six were decompensating congenital hydrocephalus. 
one out of six. And this is just a convenience sample from, from some of our early work. And so that brings us to this next younger group that I've taken interest in, which is the, the transitional group. And when we wrote that paper in 2005, we called this out as an issue, and we recognize we're not the first to do that. But the lack of their transition of care to adult specialists may have, in fact we know it did, contributed to the unrecognized development of decompensating hydrocephalus. This happens all the time, and we said that we need to create systems to address this. And you know this, transitional care is ad hoc. Many patients really are abandoned. You know, I live in Baltimore, we have Johns Hopkins, we have Kennedy Creek, and those patients are let go. They're, there's only ad hoc follow-up. I see a number of them, I'll show you a couple. Uh, in, in a minute, but that's representative. And those of us who do this are really kind of learning as we go. And this is characteristic of a lot of the pediatric disorders where children survive, which is a good thing, but now we have to figure out what are they supposed to be like as they get older. We don't really know what should a young adult with con treated congenital hydrocephalus look like at age 50 or 60 or 70. We, we don't understand that. And if they're lost to follow up, not only can they be harmed, but we don't learn how to take care of them. We don't know how to put that information together. And that's why the transitional group is in our registry for the, uh, the clinical research network. So uh, this is a, a slide that Oscar Taube shared with me. He's an adolescent uh, pediatric specialist at Sinai Hospital. And he's looking at the issue of transitional care for many disorders. But there's this very interesting graph, graph here uh, which is a survey of <coughs> internal medicine residents. How comfortable would you be taking care of these disorders in adults? So the two red bars, this is cerebral palsy, less than 25%, spina bifida, less than 25%, and I think, and everything else, they're a little bit higher there, and I think that tells you about a lot of the discomfort that's out there just for the internists who would be taking care of these patients. So not only are they lost to specialty follow-up, they're taken care by a large number of doctors who aren't comfortable taking care of them. Now, Rich, I told you I was going to show you a couple of slides here, and uh, this is for the, the residents to try to figure out. This is a transitional patient I saw three weeks ago, and I, I've tuned this to the bone windows on purpose. And um, anybody want to tell me what kind of shunt is in there? Of the residents. I know that this group back here knows what they are. Dr. Lozier and Poji know what they are. Yeah. Any of the residents know it's a you, special kind of shunt. You probably haven't seen it ever put in. I could show you a skull x-ray if you'd like to see that. Would that help you? Show them a skull x-ray. All right. Anybody? It's a Torkelson. Wow. All right. So this is a Torkelson shunt. And you can see it here. It's outside. <coughs> and if you look very carefully, it's under here. Same thing back here. And it's fractured. The tip of it is actually fractured. And here I, I put together some of the, the windows. This patient got his shunt in 1960 at the age of 13. It's a calcified red rubber catheter, and you don't want to touch that. They fall apart, and God help us if they get infected. He was married in 1968. Eight years later, his wife never, ever knew he had hydrocephalus. He completely forgot it. And beginning about five years ago, he starts looking like NPH. This is a 33-year-old woman whose parents brought her to me a year and a half ago, almost two years ago. <coughs> she looks like a young adult with cerebral palsy. She uses her cell phone for Facebook. She drives her motorized wheelchair. Again, for the residents, do you know what that is? Anybody that's on the boards? Hey, Lobar Holoprosencephaly. This is Holoprosencephaly. This is, holo, this is an adult with holoprosencephaly. I've never, I, not since residency, had I seen a patient with holoprosencephaly, and only a, only a newborn. So she's doing fantastically. Now the story here is that I saw her when she was normal. I knew what she was like. About six months later, she had a suprapubic catheter put in at another institution, happened to see me in clinic the next Monday, and she was hallucinating, she was seeing things, she was delirious, we had to admit her to the hospital, and the biggest challenge was to convince everybody that having hallucinations and seeing fire on the ceiling was not normal for her. Everybody assumed that because she had these impairments, this was normal for her. Uh, so there's a lot of children who uh, have hydrocephalus. 
Uh, and this is my lifetime perspective, and I really think that every patient with hydrocephalus at every age and every stage of life should mature and advance successfully to the next stage of life, and they need our help to make that happen. And the last thing I'm going to tell you about hydrocephalus is I'm going to challenge the dogma. The dogma is hydrocephalus is a CSF disorder. This is why you put in shunts. This is why you do ETVs. But this is a mantra that I've been using since the NIH workshop, which is this is a brain disorder. Hydrocephalus injures the brain. That's why patients have symptoms. That's why they have reversible symptoms. It's a unique form of reversible neuronal or glial injury. The complications of treatment hurt the brain. We need to understand the biological mechanisms that underlie this. And someday, we all hope we'd like to give a pill for hydrocephalus rather than to operate on these patients. And this is my worldview of hydrocephalus for you. So now let's switch gears. I want to talk to you about my NASA work. This is the zero-G and ICP portion of the talk. Space Station. And then they started to find another and another, and pretty soon they knew that they had a problem. <coughs> By that point, at least one astronaut had had a lumbar puncture <coughs> after coming back from space. The CSF pressure was elevated. This paper was published in 2011. Tom Mater is one of the flight surgeons who first discovered this. And uh, I was put in touch with them through the Intracranial Hypertension Research uh, Foundation, and I had my first phone call with them in 2010. So I'm hearing all of this the first time in 2010, and I smacked my forehead. I said, they've got a big problem. I also knew that they were going to have to fund clinical research to, to answer this. And as it happened, I had a flight someplace else that <coughs> night, uh, and I wrote down my thoughts, and you, know, you can sort of see it got me pretty excited. These are all my thoughts on what could those mechanisms be for increased CSF pressure in zero gravity, and it really makes you rethink everything you think you know about intracranial pressure physiology and cerebral <laughs> blood flow physiology. So astronauts on long duration space flight, this is more than three months, coming back to Earth with papilledema and changes in their vision. It was never ever seen in the space shuttle program, only long duration space flight. The CSF pressure is a little bit high, but it doesn't get better. And this is the other thing that's very peculiar. If it's just a zero gravity phenomenon, you have to ask, well, why doesn't it get better in 1G? So what's permanently changing in these astronauts? And NASA thinks it's pseudotumor cerebri, but they don't really know. So here are the changes that they see. Hyperoptic shift, cotton wool spots. If you do MRI in pseudotumor, you'll see flattening of the globe. They see this in their astronauts. They call this visual impairment intracranial pressure. They get choroidal folds. They get haplodema. And if you do ultrasound, you'll see dilation of the optic nerve sheath. So this looks a lot like pseudotumor, except, and they have some modestly increased pressure, there's early change in visual acuity. That's wrong for pseudotumor. In pseudotumor, visual acuity is the last thing to go. You get constriction of the visual fields first, you get transient visual obscurations, and that's not happening. They have no visual field constriction, no enlargement to the blind spot, no TVOs, no headaches or pulsatile tinnitus. So it's got some features that looks like pseudotumor, but others that don't. And in fact, caplodema doesn't require increased ICP. There are lots of other potential causes for it. Now, most of those, in fact, can be ruled out with a good medical evaluation. So they're not having infiltration or compression or ischemia and, and so forth. So it's really raising the question what's going on with them. Now, it's a problem for NASA because of those astronauts who have been tested, three quarters of them have symptoms of it, and this is their grading scale. Of all astronauts, and not all of them have been tested, that's still half of them. They'd like to get to Mars. If all you do is fly to Mars and come back and don't stop, that's a 500-day space flight. 
and there seems to be a dose response to it. The longer they are in space, the more likely they are to have this. So NASA really needs to understand it. So their, their prevailing hypothesis is that when we're standing, we get fluid pooling in our legs. That's why we wear support hose. And in zero gravity, that gradient disappears. And they're calling this the cephalad fluid shift. You know, there's, there's no pressure gradient. And, you know, we see that in astronauts. This is before and after they get this puffy face and their legs get very skinny. They call it puffy face bird legs syndrome. And, in fact, their jugular veins get distended. And you say, well, gosh, that's easy. Central venous pressure is going up in space. Except that it doesn't. I'm going to show you that in a, in a second. But CVP is important for intracranial pressure physiology because it influences sagittal sinus pressure, which influences the intracranial pressure. So what actually happens to central venous pressure in space? So Jay Bucky, who's a flight surgeon, he's now at Dartmouth, along with uh, Ben Levine, who's a cardiovascular physiologist at UT Southwest, put a pick line into astronauts going up on the space shuttle. So here they are, supine in the suit room. Then they get into the orbiter, they call it the orbiter, not the shuttle. Their legs are up in the air, they're on their back, their legs are up in the air, and so that's why the central venous pressure is a little higher. They lit the match right here. And this is right when they get into orbit. They call it MECO. They love acronyms. Main engine cutoff, MECO. And CVP is actually lower than it was supine in gravity. And here's the whole curve right here. So how do they have dilated jugular veins and low CVP? So unless you measure it, you don't really know what's happening. If you think it's a pressure problem, you have to measure the pressure. It's actually a change in compliance that happens in zero gravity. So now ask yourself, well, what's the influence of gravity on intracranial pressure physiology? And Sarah Farlander uh, is a physiologist from the University of uh, Umiya. She works with my friends Jan Malm and Anders Eklund. I've done a lot of work with them. And there's this notion called the hydrostatic indifference point, which is the point along the the long axis where you would measure the same pressure regardless of the position. And the original paper was written by Magnus in 1976, and he only included the CSF column. But we know that there are other columns of fluid that influence this, and they looked specifically at the jugular vein. So one model was that the jugular vein was always open, and the other model, which kind of reflects our reality, is, is once you reach a certain elevation, your jugular vein collapses. And they, they actually did the mathematics on these models to figure out what would the pressure at altitude curves, degrees of elevation, and then they measured it in patients. And so this is the Magnus curve. The dark triangle, the gray triangle, is actually the one where the jugular vein collapses, and the black squares are the measured pressures. So it's showing us, at least the model very closely matches what is measured in humans. So that collapse of the jugular veins is important. All of you should have collapsed jugular veins. That's influencing your central venous pressure, which is diverting a lot of your flow through the cervical plexus, which is a higher resistance plexus. And so this influences the intracranial pressure, but in zero gravity, your jugular vein is always open. It's dilated. So you don't have that collapse of the jugular vein that we have two-thirds of the time in one gravity. And if the CVP really is zero, then there's only a few ways that CSF pressure can be increased in space. If you look at, at the equations for intracranial pressure, one is that CSF production would increase. Another is CSF outflow resistance somehow increases. The next is craniospinal compliance decreases. Or maybe we just haven't measured it for long enough and CVP ultimately increases. Or the intracranial fluid volume, the interstitial fluid volume, somehow increases. So really think through all of this physiology. And in fact, Sarah, Sarah and I just wrote a chapter together on the first textbook for VIP that will be published next year. And we, kind of, we came up with seven hypotheses that need to be investigated that, that either could explain or explain away increased ICP in space. So I, I actually don't believe that this cephalad fluid shift is, is the cause. The next, and this is the interesting one, that the ICP, the sagittal sinus pressure, and the CVP are insufficiently low in microgravity. You know, they're relatively low when we're upright, but it's not quite that low in zero gravity. This one you'll be interested in. You know Batson's plexus? So the abdominal pelvic plexus is in direct communication 
with the epidural veins. If you press on the abdomen in spine surgery, you'll get some, some bleeding. And in fact, if you have this fluid shift from the legs, it's not going to go to the head, it's going to go to the abdomen first. And that could increase the volume of the epidural venous plexus, which is going to reduce the volume of the spinal canal, and which contributes about a third of intracranial compliance. And then there are some other hypotheses that are, are uh, possible in here. So now, let me actually show you some of the very first measurements ever of intracranial pressure in humans in zero gravity. And uh, Justin Lawley is a wonderful postdoc. He's from Wales. And he's working with Ben Levine, who's a friend of mine at UT Southwest. Uh, and I'm a, a co-investigator on, on this work. I've also done some work on non-invasive ICP, but this is much more interesting for you. And to measure ICP in humans in parabolic flight, we had to find humans who had accessible CSF spaces. So we looked for patients who had Omaya reservoirs. They worked with their neurosurgeon at UT Southwest and found young adults who'd had an Omaya reservoir put in because they needed chemotherapy. <laughs> and they were well, they were adults, uh, they found five of them, and we put a 25 gauge needle into the Omaya reservoir. And in fact, this is a, from one of my patients, we put a needle into the shunt reservoir, and sometimes we'll measure that pressure either dem to demonstrate siphoning or sometimes to demonstrate shunt obstruction, and then did traditional fluid coupled uh, transduction, multimodality, and, and parabolic flight. Now, when you do parabolic flight, it's kind of simple. The airplane's either going up or going down. So you have to think about the axis of the patient on that aircraft. If they're on the long axis of the aircraft, their head is either going to be down or up. So we put them perpendicular to the axis of flight so that the angle of the plane was not causing a hydrostatic pressure gradient that could be influencing that. So they're basically going from 0G to 2G in those flights. This is Justin enjoying the 0G. This is one of the patients, and, and they're doing lots of things. He's got a pick line, he's got transcranial Doppler, uh, he's actually doing some exercise in this. They were looking at the influence of, of exercise. So, zero gravity, zero gravity, zero gravity. Anybody get, want to guess what happens to ICP in zero gravity? How many are in the it goes up category? <coughs> Rich, you're putting your neck on the line there. How many are in the it doesn't change category? How many are in the it goes down category? And how many are the hell I don't know category? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is the beauty of measuring the physiology, and here's what happens. This is plus 2G, this is 0G. 0G, 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 0G. That's your baseline. And let me just show you this in, in group. So 0G, 1G. Uh, this is central venous pressure, also drops, similar to what we saw in the astronauts. Blood pressure, not a big change. This is the ultrasound of the jugular vein, 1G, 0G. It really does get bigger, and those are the volumes there. So at least in parabolic flight, the ICP falls and probably correlates with central venous pressure. Now they're also doing some head down tilt experiments, and head down tilt is a standard model for looking at zero gravity physiology. I, we actually think it's not appropriate for ICP physiology, but other than the initial loading that you get by putting the head down, the CSF pressure does not increase with continuous ICP measurements. And so we think acutely and subacutely, ICP in humans is not elevated in zero G. But nobody knows what happens long duration. <clears throat> so what's next? This is my grant. We're going to measure ICP directly in astronauts on the International Space Station. Uh, about uh, 15 months ago, NASA put out an announcement asking for this. They've heard us. We've been saying to them all along, until you measure this in astronauts in space, you aren't going to know what's going on. And uh, so they put out the request for the applications. We were awarded the grant uh, in February. And, and this is the, the team that we've got, Eric Rashad. A neurointensivist at Baylor, and he actually has a lot of other work with NASA. John Clark, who is a neurologist uh, and a NASA flight surgeon. Anybody remember the, the guy, Crazy Felix, who jumped out of the balloon at 120-some thousand feet? The Red Bull guy? Mm -hmm. 
John was the flight surgeon for, for that project. Ben Levine, who did the parabolic flight work, Jan Malm and Anders Eklund from UMIA, and then Doug Hamilton, who's a <laughs> flight surgeon at University of Calgary, and actually was involved in some of the very first descriptions of this VIP syndrome. So let me stop there, and we can take some questions. I know you've got another conference coming on, and Rich, let me thank you again for having me out here. That was, that was terrific. Um, I, want, I do have one question. I have a theory, and no one, I was a little surprised, three came closest to this theory. I don't think we understand the relationship between intra-abdominal pressure and ICP. Because I've started measuring occasionally the intra-abdominal pressure, and I think there are even thin people that have negative pressure that causes the siphoning, causes the lower ICP. And there are other people that I think live in a different world where they have increased abdominal pressure, puts a lot of pressure on the venous plexus, and they have a higher ICP. But no one is really willing to measure the intra-abdominal pressure accurately to understand that phenomenon or its relationship to one-third of the CSF. Any thoughts about intra-abdominal pressure? Sure. Uh, Marvin Bergsnyder at UCLA did this, I think, in the NPH population, yes. either that group or, or the pseudotumor population, about 15 uh, years ago. And, and it's not terribly elevated. Uh, but I, I think that you're right. We don't understand sort of the, the back pressure component of, of shunting. Now, think, I want you to think about ventriculo-jugular shunts, ventriculo-atrial shunts, based on what I've shown you. We're putting the tip of that shunt next to the heart, which is below the jugular vein. So we're bypassing that natural anti-siphon device that we have. And so you can, in <coughs> fact, get siphoning with ventriculoatrial shunts. I've proven that by monitoring the, 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 the pressure. So you're bypassing that natural increase in venous pressure, sagittal sinus pressure from the jugular vein closing. So I don't think that we understand that as well as we should. And even in the pseudotumor population, it's not entirely clear uh, whether that abdominal pressure has anything to do with it. There's been a large study that, that shows that uh, obesity probably doesn't uh, contribute as much to increase CSF pressure on its own as, as we might think. That's great. Uh, Peter Chiarelli. Oh, I'm sorry, Jeff. Peter. Yeah, go ahead, Peter. What do the brains look like of these astronauts who come back? I mean, do they have interstitial edema or transcendental flow or big vents? It's normal. Nor normal looking brains. Their, so their eyes do have the, the flattening. Uh, of, of the globe, and uh, they do seem to have the, the dilation of the optic nerve sheath. Uh, so, uh, but even there, the, the normal anatomy and physiology isn't in, entirely clear. Um, it's possible that there's a compartment syndrome along the optic nerve sheath, and that somehow the pressure is building up just behind there. Um, you said Gosh. CSF pressure by lumbar puncture is still elevated. Yeah, and, but there's only been a handful of them who've had it. So part of the work that we've proposed to NASA is that you have to know what is the pressure before spaceflight, during spaceflight, and after spaceflight. You have to do this in the astronauts. Because if you, if you don't have a reference point, then you really don't know whether they're, they're high or not. And, and it has to, probably we'll have to do, you'll have to do that non-invasively. Pierre Moreau, who is, you know, this is an institution that has been um, on the forefront of uh, ultrasound, as you know, this is where ultrasound was developed and so on, and he does non-invasive ultrasound. So I gotta make sure you meet him. Well, he's not here at Grand Rounds for whatever reason, but a little comment, that's a, Right? Or you're thinking of doing non-invasively, right, Mike? I well, no, I'm <coughs> proposing lumbar punctures on, on all of them. Okay. Uh, to, and, and we're going to correlate that with non-invasive methods. And they're exploring a number of different non-invasive methods, and that's an entirely separate talk. But, you know, once, once we can calibrate, then we can understand. Jeff? So uh, the, the NPH group, in, in kids, the shunt-associated headache rate is, what, 25%? Something fairly high. And I think what the real reason it's hard to get a neurosurgeon to see a shunt patient is because they come in, the scan's fine, everything's fine, but okay. it's the shunt. And it may be the shunt, but you, what, what, in NPH, is it the similar story, or are the, what's, what, how yeah. often do you get the person that maybe that migrates, maybe it's the shunt? Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm sure you know the work of uh, Marianne Euler from, from uh, Denmark, who's actually looked at the headache problem in the pediatric population. And, 
and um, many of them have a separate headache syndrome in addition to the shunt. And in fact, that's also true for the adult pseudotumor uh, population. If you ask the MPH patients, either about headache or head fullness, they're more likely to endorse some sense of head fullness. Now, I didn't know to start asking about that until I kept hearing it over and over from them. You know, my head feels different or, or full. Now, you know, they all come in and they've read about NPH on the internet and they want to tell me that they feel sloshing in their head, which I don't necessarily believe, but I do accept their description of head fullness. But it's this young and middle-aged group where it's more characteristic of, of a headache. It's a chronic daily headache. It's not an intermittent headache. It's what you would expect for untreated and uh, decompensating hydrocephalus. The other thing about the, the elderly group with NPH is they almost never <coughs> get post-LP headaches. Uh, and in fact, if they do get a post-LP headache, <coughs> it probably means that they don't have NPH. So there, there's something that's different about this older population and the, the uh, physiology of CSF-related pressure-related headache. Shake and then uh, Bruce. So um, I'm sure you're aware that there's a, uh, let's say, a theory that uh, um, pseudotumor cerebri is caused by, or one of the causes uh, is a stenosis of the venous sinuses. And we have a faculty member <coughs> who will be joining us in July who has a big interest in this, and there's a group of endovascular folks who are putting in stents. Uh, I think in this population of uh, space uh, people, maybe what about to do MRVs? Oh, uh, they've done that. You've done that? And yeah, there's no, there's, there's no stenosis. There's no stenosis. No, they've, 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 the they've, they've done that. I mean, they, 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 and trust me, these astronauts have had the billion dollar workup, and, and you know, this is why they still don't have an answer. They're looking for it, but they don't have it. And the one thing that they haven't done is to measure the, the CSF pressure. And, and there's this huge ambivalence about, you know, lumbar punctures. I mean, these are guys who attach themselves to a rocket and go up to space, and they seem to be afraid of a lumbar puncture. Uh, you know, I've had one, and it's not that bad if you know what position to get in and somebody who does it is doing it well and this is part of our sales job to them and in fact I, I've written separately the the ethical justification to the astronauts why I think that it, they owe it to themselves to go through this research because if we understand this they're going to be the very first beneficiaries of whatever we learn from that research more than our patients will they'll be the very first beneficiaries and it's to their interest to solve this problem because they love to fly they want to go to Mars, but nobody's going to Mars until we solve this problem and a lot of the, the other rocket-related issues in, involved in going to Mars. Last question, Bruce. Um, Mike, that was uh, absolutely uh, terrific. Uh, you and I have talked on the phone, Bruce Ransom here. Um, they say that timing is everything, and you, my friend, have impeccable timing. Uh, not only have you taken us back and opened the book again about hydrocephalus, especially about normal pressure hydrocephalus, but the book is opening many times. Mike and Nettergaard's work about brain extracellular space right. and the circadian uh, rhythm of parenchymal CSF flow reminds me that there may be real serious disturbances in that phenomena in people that leave planet Earth uh, and travel in space. Um, You've probably thought about that, but it seems to me there's no real way of grappling with it without being able to make some Right, right. So in, in fact, Mekin Nadergaard uh, is, uh, has done this amazing work on the so-called glymphatic uh, sy uh, system. Uh, and it, it hit the, the headlines with their publication, I think it was in Science, about a year and a half ago, uh, look, looking at CSF flow or interstitial fluid flow uh, and it, uh, oh gosh, Bruce, I'm trying to remember, does it go up or down in sleep? So it goes, it goes way up uh, in, in sleep. sleep the right. garbage is removed right. and the streets are clear. Right. <laughs> so everybody, everybody was saying, wow, this is how we flush out the toxins of Alzheimer's disease, and maybe this is impaired in Alzheimer's disease. But I read that paper and I said, wait a minute, hydrocephalus pseudotumor. And in fact, we had a workshop with NASA on VIP in uh, February last year, and Macon attended at our in invitation. 
Uh, it turns out she's a classmate of Marianne Euler, who's a pediatric neurosurgeon in, in Copenhagen. So she, her work is, is very fascinating. And I think somebody's probably going to try to work on an animal model to investigate what's happening in, in space. If we can show some variation in the animal models, then that really poses the question of, is the same thing happening to us uh, in space? And, and I really want to understand what is the relationship of that to hydrocephalus or to, to pseudotumor, because B waves in hydrocephalus only come out in sleep. And so if we have disrupted glymphatic flow and increased ICP in sleep, what's happening to the interstitial fluid clearance in that disorder? And we still don't understand how do these patients who've had symptoms for weeks or months or years <coughs> get better in just two or three days of CSF drainage? If we understand that biology, we're going to learn a lot about the brain and we're going to be able to develop some treatments that may be applicable to other disorders.